Well hello Internet and welcome to part 8 of my Inkscape video tutorial. This is going to be the final part of my Inkscape video tutorial so that means I need to cover all the things I haven't covered previously. So we're going to talk about patterns, clipping, masking, converting to bitmap, tracing, raster extensions, and a whole bunch of other different things. If you haven't seen any of the previous parts of the tutorial I provide a link in the upper right hand corner to them as well as a link in the description underneath this video. So I have a lot to do so let's get into it. Okay, so here we are inside of Inkscape, and since we're going to be doing a lot of things with bitmaps in this tutorial, let's talk a minute about how we import bitmaps. So we're just going to go into File, come down here to Import, click on that, and then you're going to see all of the different types of files you can use inside of Inkscape. Just click down here and scroll through. SVG, PDF, Adobe Illustrator, GIMP gradients, da 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 da, and of course you can include bitmaps and pings and texts and all sorts of other different things, JPEGs, pretty much anything you can ever imagine. But I'm just going to leave this set way up here at the top, scroll 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 to all Inkscape files. And I'm going to find a picture inside of here and I'm going to click on it and I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say open. And that brings us to the big decision you're going to need to make. Are you going to embed the image or are you going to link to it? Now whenever you link to an image or a graphic of some sort, the downside or the positive side of doing so is if an outside graphics program changes said graphic or image, that is going to be immediately transferred translated inside of Inkscape. Another positive of course is if you link to images that is going to bring down the size of your SVG file. If however you decide to embed the image, if that image is affected in any way outside of Inkscape, it is not going to show up inside of your Inkscape file. So in this situation I'm just going to embed and I'm going to hit OK. And there is a particularly goofy picture of one of my babies. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at patterns which I have previously talked about. Basically what a pattern is going to allow you to do is easily crop an image inside of another object. So let's say that I want to draw a star and I want to put my baby's picture inside of said star in a kind of cheesy type of way. Well if I want to convert this graphic into a pattern I just select it and I'm going to come up here to object, click on that and come down to pattern and say objects to pattern. Pretty easy. Now if I want to put this picture inside of this star right here, all I need to do is open up the fill stroke panel of course and click on this little guy here. Now you can see the baby's picture shows up inside of there. Now the weird thing about this, and it is weird, is how you're going to edit or move around or rotate your pattern inside of this object. First off, you have to come over and select the node tool. Then you're gonna see these random things sort of floating. Here's an X, here is a circle, and way down here is a square. Each one of those is going to do something quite different to your pattern inside of the object. You're going to be able to move the pattern around by clicking and dragging with the X. You're going to be able to rotate the image by clicking and dragging with the little circle. And way down here, you're going to be able to enlarge, and yes, you can hold down control to constrain the enlargements by clicking and dragging on the square. And this is the square down here. And that is the basics. No, you cannot click inside of here and move it around. If you want to move things around, you're going to have to click on the X and move around that way. So that is the basics and that's pretty much everything you need to know. Oh yeah, one other thing. Yes, you can still come in here and grab the node points and change them and that is not affected and the pattern works perfectly. So there's the basics of how to use patterns. Now we're going to take a look at clipping. Now clipping is also going to provide a way to crop images and let's come in here and zoom in a bit so we can see this a little bit better. Now let's say that I want to crop out just a part of this picture. Well, I'm just going to use the rectangle tool right here and then let's go in here and draw over everything that I want to remain on the screen. Okay, so I have that selected and of course I'm gonna to have to also come in here and select all this and then you go up to object and come down to clip and come in here and click on set and you can see only the part that I had highlighted or that I drew the rectangle on is going to remain on the screen. However clipping is what we call non-destructive so that means I can come in here and click on object and click on clip and go release and we're back to where we started at. 
And that is the basics of clipping. One thing you do need to know, however, is let's say you have numerous different objects and you want to apply a clipping path to them. Make sure you hold down Control and G after selecting all the objects to group them. If you don't do that, you might have some problems. So now let's take a look at masking. Now masking is very, very similar to clipping. The only difference is, is masking relies on the color of the masked path to determine the transparency of what is left. So since we're using a dark gray here, if I come in here and select this and go into object and mask and set, you're going to see that I'm left with a semi-transparent image here on the screen. If, however, let's go back and I click on this and I change this to white, you're going to see that a mask pretty much just becomes a clipping path. So selected both, object, mask, and set, and there you can see there is no transparency on the screen. And of course if we went and placed a black rectangle over top of this, the whole entire thing would disappear. So now you are an expert on masking, and yes indeed, masking, let's reapply this, masking also is non-destructive, so if we go object and mask and release, you're going to see that we are back where we started at. So we are just banging right through this. What would happen, for example, if we were to create an extremely complex sort of graphic with tens of thousands of nodes, and we're done with it, and we want to limit the screen size, and we want our files to load quicker, and so forth and so on, and we know we never, ever, ever, ever want to change it. Well, we would convert it to a bitmap. So let's just draw something here. Let's say that we want to convert this simple square we have here into a bitmap. How we would do so is to select it, of course, and then go Edit, and then come down here and click on Make a Bitmap Copy. Now if we would come in here and select the node tool, well guess what? Can't do anything with that. The only thing to remember, however, is there are actually two rectangles here on the screen. This guy right here underneath does still have the nodes. This one right here does not. And you can also see a hint in regards to what you're dealing with. See here I have the rectangle with nodes selected. Well if I come down here to the bottom of the screen you're going to see rectangle. If however I select this rectangle and come down to the bottom of the screen you are now going to see image. So there you go. So now you are an expert in regards to how to convert graphics into bitmaps. So now let's take a look at something a little bit more complicated which is tracing. Now Inkscape allows you to trace bitmaps and to save time I went ahead and I'm going to show you numerous different examples on all the different ways you can trace bitmaps. But what you're going to find is unlike some other graphics programs Inkscape whenever it traces a bitmap and converts it into vector art it doesn't necessarily try to make a vector representation of the bitmap. But instead what it tries to do is provide vector art that you can then go in and manipulate and use however you would like. How you open it up and begin tracing a bitmap is to just go into path right here and trace bitmap. Pretty simple. Click on that and there you are going to see all of the numerous different options that are available for you. Now basically I'm going to run through all these guys so that you can see everything all at once and then I'm going to show you sample images and you're going to change the thresholds and the colors and all that to get different results. But we're going to see exactly how that works. Basically brightness cutoff if that is selected and also you cannot select multiple say you're only going to be able to select one of these at a time. Brightness cutoff is basically going to create black and white vector art. That's what it does. And as you're going to see here the higher the threshold setting the fewer pixels that will be considered to be white. So let's just take a look at that real quick. There you can see the original image and here you can see if the threshold is set at 0.4 the results and if the brightness cutoff is set to 0.6 the results. Then of course this is vector art after you trace it of course you could then go in and change this from black if you'd like to some other color and that is basically how brightness cutoff works. And I really really simplify this by using a pretty simple image but if you use more complicated images it's going to get quite interesting. However it can be a little bit taxing on your computer. And that brings us to the second option which is edge detection. Basically what edge detection is going to do, you can see it right here, there's the original, there is edge detection with a threshold of 0.1 and there is edge detection with a threshold of 0.3. And of course you get dramatically different results by messing around with the thresholds. 
But in essence, what edge detection does is finds edges by determining if a pixel is near a contrasting color. And then it makes determinations on whether the final result or the final pixels should show up on your screen. Color quantization, which is right here, which is going to be changed or is going to have its results changed, depending upon the number of colors you include, is going to give you results, just like you see right there. And in essence, what it's doing is it's going to generate vector art based on the number of output colors you define, and then it is going to go off on its own and determine how to treat certain images as black or as nothing. And you can see that kind of made my baby look like a superhero there. <laughs> but you can see that these are quite distorted images, but as you go in and mess around with this stuff, you're going to find interesting ways to work with it. Invert image, of course, if that's selected, that's going to invert the image. Let's come through here and take a look at brightness steps. Now we're starting to see some things look a little bit more normal. Basically, what brightness steps is going to do, as you're probably guessing, is make a grayscale group of objects based on the number of shades of gray that you set with steps. And let's take a look at that. Bring it up here. Brightness steps right here. And eight is going to determine the number of objects that are going to be used. And there's an example if we use eight, and there's an example if we use 20. So as you can see, the more that you use, the more complicated the math, but the more like a normal photograph you're going to get. Colors, of course, is gonna make a grouped bunch of objects, just like we did with brightness steps. However, this is gonna be based on the number of colors that you say that you want to include. And there is the picture with eight, and there is the picture with 50. And then finally, grays is sort of going to give you a result somewhere between brightness steps and colors. Or you could just think of it this way, it's in essence going to be colors if they were set to grayscale. So there's a rundown of all the different ways we can trace bitmaps. So now let's go through all these other different things. Smooth, if checked, is basically going to apply a Gaussian blur on the bitmap before it's going to convert it into vector art. Stack scans is going to stack colored objects to help avoid gaps whenever the vector art is generated. Remove background is going to remove the background layer when it's all done. Then we can also go over here to options. Suppress speckles, as you may guess, is going to go in there and kind of ignore spots that are in the bitmaps. Smooth corners is going to smooth the corner on their traces. And optimized paths is going to optimize the paths by joining objects with the same or similar colors. And there is a rundown, pretty much a complete rundown, of how trace bitmap works. Now something I get asked about all the time is how to do photo editing inside of Inkscape. And really, to be honest, Inkscape isn't meant to do photo editing. However, if you are in a bind, something that is done at times, and I really just don't even know how I'm going to come in here and edit this, but let's say that we want to, well, of course you can come in here, I mean, with a graphic, like that's not a photo though. Uh, one thing you can do if you're in a bind and you want to make a quick change without going outside of Inkscape is something that you may have forgotten that I covered, and that's a trick you can use with the dropper tool. So let's say, and I'm just going to use squares here just to keep this simple, and I'm also going to use grayscale squares. So let's just draw a couple of these guys inside of here, and like that, and like this. Throw in another one, and then throw in another one. Now, let's say that I have this guy. Let's go and let's shrink him down a little bit. And let's also come in here and throw him up on top. There we are. Okay, so let's say this is our blemish that we have in our image. This one dot right here. This is the guy that we want to get rid of and blend it into the background. And as you can see, the background is pretty doggone complex. There's a whole bunch of different colors here, and if this is the blemish we want to get rid of and we want to blend it into the background, how would we do it? Well, first off, we would select it and then get our dropper tool that is over here. And if we want to find a color that is pretty similar to everything that surrounds it, what we do is we click and we drag. And you're going to see that it changed that object that we had right there and made it sort of go away. Another thing we could do if we are just looking at this guy right here as a blemish is to come in here and draw a rectangle over top of it 
and in this situation that rectangle is not going to have a fill and also use the dropper tool in this situation to click and drag to try to make it blend into its background of course you could get different results by clicking and dragging in different places so in essence that is something you can do real quickly to photo edit a graphic but like i said before inkscape just really isn't made for editing photographs the last thing that I want to cover is extensions and more specifically now inside of Inkscape there are numerous different extensions and in a previous part of the tutorial I went through every single filter that is available to you and I'll provide a link to that in the description as well and I went through every single one of these and showed exactly what each of them showed up like all in a graphic on a page on my website but if we go into extensions you're going to see all of these other different options that are available to you and I decided to just let you go and explore all that stuff on your own because it's kind of interesting but one thing that I did cover you can see right here you can come in here and generate barcodes and calendars and all sorts of other different crazy stuff but what I did specifically for raster is on my website I went through and got an image and showed an example of what all of those different raster extensions do to images as you can see right there just to help you along and so you could pretty much easily say if there was anything here that you'd want to do in regards to raster extensions inside of Inkscape. So it's been fun going through all these different tools inside of Inkscape. Later on I might come back through here. Well I definitely will come back and start drawing graphics and so forth inside of Inkscape. But for now I thought this was a good ending for the Inkscape video tutorial. Please leave your questions and comments below. Otherwise till next time.